Does it feel different to be up there without a rope? It's obviously like much higher consequence. People who know a little bit about climbing, they're like, oh, he's totally safe. And then people who really know exactly what he's doing are freaked out. I've thought about El Cap like for years, and every yeah. year I'm like, that's really scary. <sighs> I'll never be content unless I at least put in the effort. El Cap is the most impressive wall on Earth. It's 3,200 feet of sheer granite. It's the center of the rock climbing universe. Obviously, I get interview questions about it all the time. Oh, would you like to do that? And you're like, yes, for sure. So you're a girlfriend now, I heard. It's awesome. <laughs> Pretty much makes life better in every way. It's really hard for me to grasp why he wants this. But if he doesn't do this stuff, he'd regret it. Everybody who has made free soloing a big part of their life is dead now. I haven't been injured in like seven years. I suddenly start getting injured all the time. What if something happens? Oh. What if I don't see him again? I could just walk away, but it's like, I don't want to. I've always been conflicted about shooting a film about free soloing just because it's so dangerous. It's hard to not imagine your friend falling through the frame to his death. I think when he's free to learn, that's where he feels the most alive, most everything. How can you even think about taking that away from somebody? No mistakes tomorrow. It's starting to get kind of psyched. If you're pushing the edge, eventually you find the edge. I can't believe you guys are actually going to watch. Hey, Jimmy, do you copy? Just started climbing. Please welcome professional climber and environmentalist Alex Honold and professional climber, skier, photographer, and director Jimmy Chin and best-selling author and PBS series host, Kelly Corrigan. Pretty awesome. <laughs> hey, everybody, how are you? Good morning. So, we're in a room full of engineers, and everything that you want to do in life depends in some way on design and great technology and the evolution of both such that you can do ever weirder and harder things, <laughs> such that a helicopter can land in a different kind of place, such that there's a lens on a camera that's lighter to carry so that you can get another day of filming in, such that there's some new kind of shoe that won't pierce through the bottom when you step on the wrong part of a wall. And so my question is, is there a product or a piece of equipment that you just marvel at every time you use it? Oh. Jimmy uses a lot more gear than me, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. I haven't been asked that question. You're winning. Well, so when they prepped me for this, they said that Jimmy and Alex challenge you to ask them questions that they've never been asked before. So one you, point for me. Yeah, we just... <laughs> no, she's winning, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I guess an obvious one for me would just be the, the new digital revolution in terms of cameras, because I started out shooting on, you know, slide transparencies. And, yeah, that tells you how old I am. But, <laughs> you know, when the digital revolution happened in terms of being able to shoot on a DSLR, like film on a DSLR, that was pretty extraordinary. Um, and it was a huge shift for, for, for me and a lot of people who filmed in the outdoors or in the mountains where weight is an issue. Uh, and for me, because I was a photographer and a filmmaker, the idea that I could shoot both on one camera using the same lenses just really opened the doors up for me to be able to shoot a lot more 
in environments that usually limited, you know, the amount of weight or equipment I could carry. And, and that's really the, the start of, uh, like, the feature filmmaking uh, career, because we made the film Meru after the kind of new DSLR came out, so. And you being able to shoot Meru is the way that most of us will ever experience Meru. So it's really this consequential development that you're able to do what you're able to do such that we can go places that most of us will never go and certainly do things that most of us will never do. So cheers to the designers yeah. on that. Cheers to you. <laughs> what about you? What's your favorite? Like a pe there must be something. Like my husband's just a biker, and he has like little things that he just. Actually, it's not so much any specific piece of gear, but I will say I've been climbing my whole life as well, and basically all climbing gear is steadily getting slightly lighter, slightly better, slightly smaller, and to the point that every every maybe five years or so, I hold my whole rack. You know, basically the assortment of gear that you use for a climb. I'm just like, it's so small now, it's so light. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, I mean, I notice it from time to time. So I think in 2012, I first set the speed record on, on El Cap, actually, which is showing right there. It's like a 3,000 foot wall. And then somebody broke that eventually, and then I did it again with a different partner years later. And in the intervening time, the ropes had gotten lighter, the equipment had gotten smaller. Basically, everything about it had changed just a little bit, but enough so that you're like, oh, this actually does make it substantially easier. And so, you know, basically every year you're like, oh, it's just a little bit better. Like, it's nice. And how is it getting a little bit safer? Well, it depends how you use the gear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it could, it, it totally depends. <clears throat> but the thing about pushing the, the edges of a sport is that, yes, you could use the lighter gear to carry more of the gear and thus be safer, or you could use the lighter gear to carry even less of the gear and go faster. And yeah. so it's all trade-offs. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, you certainly could use it to be to be safer. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't always you don't always use it that way. Uh. My my great interest in life is how people affect one another, and how those intersections make new better things possible. And I wondered if we could tell your love story because your connection <laughs> is very meaningful and it's making a lot of things possible. So tell me about meeting Jimmy for the first time. Tell me what about Jimmy makes him. Oh boy. <laughs> uh-huh. It's these Valentine's are... Day here at PTX. All right. These are, these are questions we've never been asked, actually. I, I'm, she's I'm very impressed. Absolutely winning. Yeah, this, two points. Yeah, 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 two points. I hope someone's keeping a little tally. I am. Oh yeah, yeah. good, good. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, it's hard to say actually because Jimmy was already a well-established climbing hero, sort of photographer, videographer, climbing icon, you know, even when I was young. Not to say really? that Jimmy's old or anything, but... <laughs> but <laughs> wow, I've never heard him describe me that way. That's well, amazing. I mean, you know, but the, the film Meru was... Well, actually, so predating the, the feature of film Meru, which I'm sure a lot of us have seen on streaming services and things. Before that, there, was a, there were several different cuts of the film Meru, because after their first failed expedition, they made a little piece that was shown through the North Face, one of our mutual sponsors. And so I saw sort of every aspect of your, you know, every development in their quest to, to climb Meru. It's fitting that we're talking about Meru and it's up on the screen again. This is just a random carousel of images that goes behind us, but it's perfectly timed to what we're talking about. Just sheer, sheer coincidence. But um, so, you know, I was aware of Jimmy's work. I respected Jimmy's work. I kind of knew, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's the Jimmy Chin. You know, he's mm -hmm. like, and actually you were on a couple of the, the first expeditions that I went on as, as a young North Face athlete. Uh, you know, he was already well established, like the, the golden boy, you know, well, shooting all the. How much of this can you stand? <laughs> no, I mean, he can keep he can, going. He can listen to it all yeah, he's, he's kind of like, yes, I like can stand a little more. Alex has ever been on me. I'm serious. Aww. This is like group therapy. Wayne, I mean, what year did you ski Everest or did you, uh, with, with Kit? 2006. Yeah, okay, so that was basically the year before. 2006 was the year that I sort of started climbing full time, really. And then I sort of got sponsored in 2007. Yeah. So basically from the very beginning of me being a professional climber, Jimmy was already at the upper levels of what it meant in the, in the space. And so, you know, I've always, well, I don't want to say I respected his work, but, you know, I always think he does a good job. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah. What about you? When did, when did Alex first cross your transom? I first heard about Alex through our mutual friend Conrad 
and I had heard about a couple things that he had climbed and that he had free soloed Moonlight Buttress uh, in Zion and that he had soloed Half Dome in Yosemite. And I remember distinctly thinking, he's either a total fraud or the greatest climber of all time, <laughs> basically, in my mind. Because it, it was so futuristic in my mind that someone would solo that, that it was certainly, for me, questionable. And That's I, why you had to make a movie of it. You're like, yeah, I gotta see I this like, for myself. We gotta document <laughs> this and make sure he's actually doing what he says he's doing. Yeah. No, but then, you know, I, through, through the grapevine I heard, it was legitimate. But my initial reaction when I heard about what he'd done was I was like, there is no way somebody did that. And he's how old? And I think, how yeah. old are you? 20? I was 22 when I started doing some of the things. I mean, it was pretty unbelievable um, for, for me. I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And obviously, I'd been working with some of the greatest climbers in the world. Up yeah. So I'd seen the best of the best. And I'd filmed and shot with the best of the best. And this was still hard for me to fathom. And so. Um, then uh, Connor and I, Connor had, I think introduced us. We went, I think we went on your first international climbing expedition. Or yeah, Borneo? Yeah. Is that, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, if you've seen Free Solo, there's, you know, you see a bit of the maybe awkwardness of Alex. It was like that times 10 when I first met <laughs> <laughs> him. <laughs> That's fair. But we were. <laughs> but we all we all grow up. You know, I've seen a, quite an evolution in the last ten years. Um, but we we started working together, and I I remember on that trip we were on this wall, and it was the first time we'd ever it was the first ascent of this big this new route on this wall, and there was this really uh, like kind of crazy steep pitch of climbing, like a 120-foot pitch or something. And it was the first moment where I got to see Alex kind of questing off into unknown terrain. Like, nobody had climbed it before. And that was really eye-opening, because it was the first time I really got to see him being focused, trying something new in a really remote alpine wall, kind of. and. Uh, it, it, I remember thinking, okay, yeah, this, he's <laughs> for sure the real deal. Um, not that I questioned it up to that point even, but it was, it was pretty impressive to see. And then I think we just started um, filming and shooting together over the years. Yep. But actually, I, I might just add, though, that the film Free Solo kind of came together through sheer good fortune in that he and Chaya's wife and, and co-director of the film approached me about doing a feature film sort of coincidentally at the exact moment that I'd finally decided that I wanted to free solo Al Cap and I wanted to put the work in and I wanted to, you know, it's like it'd been something I'd been dreaming about for years and like hoping that it would just happen. And finally I realized that it was never going to just happen. I needed to actually work on it. And then coincidentally they approached me about the film at the exact same time and I was like, oh, this is perfect. We can make a film about this. Because it actually it helps quite a bit to have filmmakers involved in some way because there's so much work involved in, in preparing for a climb like this just to carry all the ropes to the top to to repel in, you know, basically it helped to have a team. So I was like, oh, it's... So they were like your Sherpas. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my friends. Oscar-winning yeah. Oscar Sherpas. Yeah. I've is, carried a lot of ropes for Alex. Let's just put it that way. Which is fine. To be fair, I've carried a lot of rope for you guys, too. That's it's, true. It's all, uh, That's true. It's all, it's all you know, it all works teammates. Out. Well, yeah. when you... Can you deconstruct for these guys, why, why, what is it about Jimmy? Is it his nature? Is it his instinct for storytelling? Is it his relationship with Chai and how that maybe changes what, way, the way he edits or the way he structures a narrative? Well, actually, Chai does all the editing. <coughs> oh. <coughs> she, I was like, careful. Like, do you have a thesis about why Jimmy is Jimmy Chin? Well, I, I mean, I've always said that, that part of Jimmy's success as an outdoor filmmaker is just the fact that you're able to get to the places that other people can't shoot as well. 
I mean, basically, Jimmy can hike quickly. He can ascend lines quickly. Like, basically, he can just get to the place and do the thing without holding people up. And I mean, just, basically, just getting there is, is half the battle. I mean, obviously, you know, getting the money shot and making it look pretty is, is something. But, <laughs> but just being able to get there at all is not easy. Well, like, I mean, because we've been on a few expeditions where, actually, with, uh, dude, man, this is perfectly timed. We were in Antarctica, and uh, this is from Antarctica. And, you know, Jimmy can ski ahead, get in position, take some cool shots of everybody skiing by, and then sort of still carry on. And you don't have to wait for him. You don't have to, you know, I mean, I think part of being a successful outdoor photographer is just being able to do the things well enough to, to stay ahead of everybody. Yeah. And why is Alex Alex? What about, his, is it his nature? Is there something about the awkwardness that actually allows him to do this sort of thing? <laughs> yeah, it means I can't find any partners. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't going to say that, but the thought has crossed my mind. There's a reason he was free soloing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's like not even a joke. I mean, yeah. that's, that's basically true. It is basically true. Um, but I would say, I don't know. I mean, this last week, it still kind of is mind-boggling. Uh, last, last week, I was in Red Rocks climbing this route called uh, the Rainbow Wall, which is this 12-pitch. If there's climbers out there, it's like 512. It's like a 1,000-foot-tall sandstone cliff. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like a project of mine. I mean, I've climbed it before, but I haven't climbed it clean. And uh, I was up there, you know, Climbing on, climbing on it, and the first couple of pitches are very difficult, or for me, well, not very difficult, but you know they're challenging. And Alex had soloed this route how, how many years ago? Like 2010. 2010. First time I it, but I've sold it several times actually, just yep, and <laughs> just in case you care. <laughs> we like accuracy, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean you know. Wait, if we, if have we you can... soloed it multiple times? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's so classic because you go on routes and you'll climb them and, you know, you'll still get to the top of a pitch and be like, I cannot believe he soloed this pitch. It's like it, you, you just can't register it. Um, and I, I've thought about it a lot, obviously. I mean, part of it is the skill and the craft of being an absolutely excellent climber and talented climber um, but it's the 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 part that's hard to understand is you know I understand how you expand your comfort zone to continue to push the edge of what you do and you know also improve in the craft of what you're doing it's just and I, I I've seen the process literally how he does it um, but it's still really hard to wrap my head around and you don't meditate, like you're not a meditator. I thought for sure as I was studying you that I was going to discover that you were like this Buddha inside. No, people, yeah, that's, it's easy thing to think. Actually, so funny enough, uh, after the film Free Solo came out uh, and we were doing sort of this crazy six-month movie tour, which I called my deployment to Hollywood because it was like this insane, uh -huh. just like events nonstop for months doing things. So during that period, I actually tried to learn how to meditate. You know, I'd sit in my hotel room and be like, oh, and... Uh, and, you know, it was fine. Like, it was great. And then as soon as I started climbing full-time again, like, as soon as the film tour wrapped up and I was back to just normal life, like, going outdoors, I was like, I just don't need this. Because I spent so much time hiking by myself in the woods and climbing and doing things. I was like, I don't need structured time where I just empty my mind because I basically get the same thing through, through climbing. Yeah. So... And, and more importantly, I don't think that having a cluttered mind is one of my big problems to begin with. It's very empty in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to follow up, though. <laughs> Not to say, yes, that's true. He's very empty up there. But no, I mean, to go back to that question of expanding the comfort zone, so much of what we do is preparation and preparation. And, you know, I felt the edges of that where I prepared for something for so long and was so kind of dialed in to what I was doing um, that I had the comfort to push the edge. And I think skiing Everest was one of those things where, you know, when I first moved to Jackson, Wyoming, skiing the Grand Teton was like a huge deal and it was a big goal of mine for many, many years. And then 
once I skied it, I started skiing it pretty routinely. But then when, before I was going to Everest, I was skiing it like three times a week, you know, mm -hmm. and just doing laps on it, laps on it. And that just, it allowed me to go to a place that was much more remote and much bigger. And I felt much more comfortable because of all of that time being comfortable in what used to be not that comfortable. So I, I kind of understand it, but the level of, just because I'm not as good of a rock climber anywhere near as Alex, but um, Neither am I. I, I can kind of get it, but it is the preparation, I think, of yeah. just building that gradually. Which, and, just, and just to be clear and, and kind of fair, I mean, I went through the exact same process, I mean, with, with El Cap specifically. I first climbed El Cap in 2006, I think, and it was our my partner and, and my big goal for the season just to get up the wall in a day. And we got up in 22 hours. We were completely crushed. It was like the hardest thing we'd ever done. And then in the 15 plus years since then, you know, I've gone from barely being able to do it in a day to setting the speed record to climbing it multiple times in a day to climbing different routes and then eventually to free soloing it. And so, you know, it's been 15 years of effort and progression and, mm -hmm. and you know, slowly building up from where we started. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a relationship between risk and progress. But there's also the very true fact that people who prepare as much and as well and as conscientiously as you do die. So we have a mutual friend, Jim Morrison, his partner, Hillary Nelson, was killed in a 6,000 foot drop in Nepal, probably one of the best in the business at what she did. I want to know how you process the fact of that, that there is no preparing your way all the way out of mortal risk. Well, part of that, I mean, we have different answers for this because he does things more in big mountains and alpine terrain, and I mostly stick to rock climbing. And certainly on rock in a place like Yosemite Valley, there are just fewer objective hazards like that. There's less random risk. And so preparation, I think, takes you a little further in places that, that, are, that are less random. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but the mountains are super complex environments and snow science and snow safety and weather and all those kinds of things, like they just, they're just more random. And so fundamentally, there's just, there's a little bit more, more chance involved with those types of endeavors. But surely when you were free soloing, you were putting your life at risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> but that said, you know, you practice it to the point that it doesn't feel like you're rolling the dice. It feels like you're just doing something that you know you can do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, of, of course, the rational mind knows that you're still sort of rolling, the, you know, there's still some chance that something could go wrong, but you're just so confident, like you just don't feel like anything will go wrong. Do you, I want to come back to you on this question, mm. but do you have mostly success fantasies or mostly fear of failure <laughs> mind? In other words, when you're imagining this move that you're going to make, this achievement that you're going to pursue, are you thinking how great it's going to be to summit? Or are you thinking about every conceivable way that it could go wrong? Or both? Yeah, bo both a little bit. I mean, I definitely spend some time thinking about how amazing it'll be to get at the top and be like, that's so incredible. But then I also think about what it would be like to fall off certain places. You know, if you fall off the hardest part of freestyling El Cap specifically, you'd bounce off this thing 60 or 80 feet below. It'd be, it'd be a horrible, horrible way to die in that it wouldn't be a clean fall, but it also wouldn't be, like, it would be a disaster. Like, you would hit all kinds of things and you would be, you would wish you were dead before you hit the ground, you know, it was like, and so you visualize those kinds of things. But I think that's important because you don't want that stuff just popping up in your mind for the first time while you're doing it. Like, while you're doing the, the difficult sections of climbing, you don't want to just suddenly realize, like, man, if I slipped here, it would be terrible. It's like, you know that it's going to be terrible, and you need to kind of set that aside ahead of time and then go up there and just perform. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with loss? You've lost people. Mm. Yeah, I was still thinking about his answer because I remember Alex talking to me about how he prepared mentally and going through worst case scenarios all the time. And it, 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 I've done it quite a bit too, because it's the only way to understand how to mitigate the risk too, in some ways. It's to live it out in like- Well, it's, and it's also to- detail. detail. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But to anticipate worst case scenarios is, is absolutely a necessity when you're 
going on expeditions or doing climbs or really in any real endeavor just so that you're prepared or not prepared to just deal with it, but that hopefully that you can mitigate the, the, the risk or the, the issue. But um, in terms of loss and risk, I mean, I think, you know, in my peer group or our peer group, we have a specific kind of relationship to risk and maybe not exactly the same, but in general, you know, I think, first of all, risk is relative, right? Like when Alex f looks like he's climbing on something that's really terrifying for 99.9% .9 of the population, it's probably like walking down the sidewalk for him. So long as, but there's traffic on the side and if, so long as he keeps walking on the sidewalk and doesn't jump into traffic, he's totally, it's pedestrian Dude, for him. Sp speaking of, when I, people talk about risk, I frequently talk about, you know, like it's not as dangerous as the city streets in New York or whatever. Anyway, I just spent two days in New York for a work thing and I was like, I stand by that. Cause New York City, like, <laughs> like every time you cross the street, you're like looking all directions and at any moment you might get blindsided by a scooter or like some electric thing you can't hear. And it's all kind of, I was like, New York is pretty sketchy. And you know, and <laughs> the thing about climbing is at least, it's a little bit more under your own control. I mean, yeah. when we're talking about preparation and, and all training and those kinds of things, I mean, it really is up to you. And if you, and, and you know, you might botch, like you might make an error and you might, but at least it'd be sort of an unforced error. Like at least it would just be on you that you made a mistake that you should have, should have seen coming. It's not like you're gonna get blindsided by a scooter and be like, whoa, never saw that coming. I don't know, I was like, New York, freaking, I mean, you <laughs> live there, like Jesus. It's amazing that he survived. I know. <laughs> For all kinds of reasons, New York is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think the way we think about risk and, you know, what we choose to do is a lot about how we view risk in general. Because I think, and I've used this quote before because it's from a good friend of mine, John Krakauer, and he said this to me early on in my career. He said, there are two great risks in life, risking too much and risking too little. And you know, just looking at life where you're evaluating the cost of risking too little, because there is a cost sure. of not taking risks. And, you know, where you decide to put that threshold is, is a very personal decision, but, you know, if you want to pursue your dreams or the greatest expression of who you are, which is what a lot of us are doing, you know, what are you willing to risk to, to, to do those things? And, you know, I think in a lot of cases, um, the accidents or how people die, they can happen in terrain or in situations that are fairly pedestrian. And it's not when they're functioning at their top level. And, some people buy this, but and some people don't. But like Alex said, I mean, essentially, life is risk. You walk out the front door and it's risk. You drive down the highway and it's risk. My wife totally does not buy this, but I actually, given I spend a lot of time assessing risk and watching people doing various things um, that other people think are highly risky, I feel like I have a pretty good point of view on it. And, you know, like in a lot of cases, people that we know in our peer group that die, have died in fairly kind of, for them, pedestrian situations in which there was an unforeseen and fairly um, unpredictable kind of objective hazard, mm -hmm. like a small, mm -hmm. Avalanche. Or Can I jump in while, while we're talking about risk? I mean, there's also something you said for making intentional choices about the risks you're willing to take. Yeah. Because I think that when we're talking about risk, we're talking about risks that we're approaching totally open-eyed. Like, this is something we want to do. We're choosing to do it. We're mitigating risk as best we can. But we're accepting the risks that we're taking. And I feel like a lot of the risk that people take in their lives are risks that they're not really choosing. You know, it's like when people go out partying on a Saturday night and then they drive home drunk, they didn't choose, like, I'm going to take this risk tonight. It's like, they just went and partied. But then it turns out they are rolling the dice and they are taking some big risks with their lives, but they're just not intentional about it. And so, 
you know, that's also the other side of like leading a really, really active lifestyle. Like we're climbing the mountains nonstop. And so we're relatively fit. And so we're at lower risk of, you know, lots of lifestyle diseases. And that's the kind of stuff where it's like, yeah, you can choose not to take risks in the mountains. But if you're leading a sedentary lifestyle, you're at higher risk for other sorts of things. You know, I mean, like my dad was a professor and he was relatively sedentary and he died of a heart attack at 55 totally out of the blue, uh, running through an airport. And you're sort of like, well, I mean, that's the other side of the risk coin. It's like, if you're not being active and you're not doing lots of things, then you're at a higher risk of just dropping dead from other causes. And so, you know, I mean, and not to totally equate them, because obviously climbing mountains is more dangerous than, than running through airports. Like, that's clear. But at least we're making intentional choices about the risks that we're, that we're choosing to take. Mm -hmm. All these years you've been out there, what are you seeing in terms of climate change? Like, is it evident to you? Are you feeling it? I would, well, I'm like speaking about risks that we don't care about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> exactly. apropos. Yeah. I mean, I think the obvious ones for people like ourselves who spend a lot of time outside, you know, you, you are hyper-conscious of the environment and weather, and you know, it's part of the reason we enjoy it, just the rawness of, of being out there. But... I would say for me the most obvious um, just visually that I think people can wrap their heads around is just the 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 glaciers in the glaciers Europe retreating retreating yeah. I mean it's I mean if you're paying attention at all it it's pretty dramatic it's right there the story's right there yeah I mean, yeah, I mean every every big mountain range in the world you can see glaciers retreating it's like yeah. I, I mean I feel like part of the reason that there's so much reluctance to act on climate in the U.S. is because we don't really have any glaciated ranges. Like in, in, the, made in, in the U.S., nobody lives near glaciers. You can't just like see them moving back up the mountain. And so, you know, but like all of South America, the Andes, you know, I mean, especially the tropical parts, like the glaciers are retreating so quickly that anybody who lives even remotely near any of those places are like, this is insane. Like, it's, mm. it's crazy. Like in Europe. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's much more clear in Europe because there's ski resorts that have, you know, the chairlifts are like very yeah. clear markers and there's no more ski resorts, you know, yeah. like they're just gone. Yeah. They're just shutting down because there's no glacier to ski on. And it's just much more um, reference points to see it. Yeah. Because obviously in the big remote mountain ranges, you can't tell and that, that unless you've gone there a lot and the people who have, you know, yeah. certainly say that. It's, you're in an interesting position because you're a filmmaker in nature and surely there's a pull to show how beautiful it is, but in showing how beautiful it is, there might be a moral hazard that people watching your films think, looks pretty good to me. Yeah, well, I mean, the other side of that is just, and I've always thought, like, people care for, will take care of, the, of what they love and when you get people outside just on like the most kind of basic fundamental level is when you spend time in these wild places and you feel the effects of you know of what they do for you at least what they do for me but um that you it will pique your interest in taking care of these places um how does that up level to you know thinking about climate change i mean it's a start i agree <laughs> but also these films um you know not to jump the gun but the the most recent film um talks a little bit about that wildlife yeah yeah and it's about the tompkins yes it's about doug tompkins and chris tompkins uh and yvonne chenard but do you know who those people are yeah, North Face, Esprit. Some people, yeah, Dagonia. I can explain. Uh, so, so Doug Tompkins founded uh, the North Face, and later on Esprit. Uh, Ivan Chenard founded Patagonia, um, and he recently gave the company away to fund Saving the Planet. Chris Tompkins was the founding CEO of, of Patagonia. Um, but it's kind of this love story of Chris and Doug and them spending 25 years of their lives building these national parks in, in Chile. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a story about um, c 
conservation, it's a love story, but it's also a story of kind of second chances and mm -hmm. living that life of deep intention. And We're going to share a little clip before we finish. I wanted to say that 80% of sustainability is determined in the design phase, which is the work of everyone here. So thank you for working with a higher purpose. Or, or maybe we should say, maybe everyone should work a little harder on it. <laughs> I didn't say it. I was saying. I mean, with, with all respect to everybody, but uh. there's. You can't study you, Alex, for that long without starting to wonder about this tension between being totally independent and being interdependent, and you've gone on quite a journey. I mean, you were a guy alone in a van who did these outrageous things without anyone knowing about it. And then you were the protagonist of an Oscar winning documentary. You fell in love on screen and you became a father. Indeed. That makes it all sound super dramatic. I and mean, when, you, when you live it, it's, it's all a little more natural. I mean, the, the, other, the other way to frame that is that I spent a lot of years focusing on being the best climber that I could be. But fully knowing, I mean, the thing is, you know, I've always been interdependent in that as a climber, you're always reliant upon partners and, and the climbing community. So even when you're living by yourself in a van, you're still climbing with people all the time. You're still part of this web of climbing. And, you know, I mean, I was always desperately trying to find a girlfriend. <laughs> I just didn't, didn't have any social <laughs> skills. But I always knew that, that eventually I wanted to have a family and then, you know, sort of settle at some point. Uh, but there were just certain things that I wanted to do first as a climber or, you know, certain things that I wanted to achieve as a climber. And so I don't know if it's a total contrast between interdependent and independence. I just think that there's always been a little bit of both. Yeah. And, and I think, thankfully for me, they kind of came in the, in the right order because I think I've done a lot of the things, I've done a lot of the really challenging things that I wanted to do as a climber while I still had tons of independence in my life. And now I have a wife and a daughter. And I think that some of those things probably would be a little bit harder to do now. Not to say it'd be impossible, but... But I'm glad that, that I sort of made the, made the choices I did. Yeah. What are you laughing about over there? Oh, I just think it's a lot easier to free solo El Cap before you get married and have children. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, well, I mean, I do too, though. And that's also why, you know, I think that a lot of people, when they watch the film Free Solo, they're like, that guy's kind of a douche. Like, he's kind of callous, and he's, like, not very nice to his girlfriend. And I'm like, yeah. That's totally true, totally fair. <laughs> <clears throat> but to some extent, that's an intentional choice that I'm prioritizing something that I've been dreaming of for 10 years and working on for years. And, you know, free selling El Cap meant a ton to me. And then I met my now wife, uh, Sonny. Like, when we started making the film. You planted her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you wish. <laughs> Actually, I would, yeah. But so, you know, just by, by sheer good luck, I met her as we started filming. And so as the film unfolds, you know, I've been dating this, this wonderful woman for six months or a year. And you're like, yeah, she's great. But that doesn't outweigh this 10-year goal of mine. I'm kind of like, you know, I mean, you could throw away a promising relationship if it means achieving a life goal, you know, even, even if it is a great relationship. Uh, you know, thankfully, and, and sort of with my wife's prompting, I didn't have to do that. You know, because I was always kind of like, well, I'll just throw it away. And she's like, why not do both? And I was like, you know, that's a good question. Why not do both? And, uh, you know, thankfully, we, we, we did. You also met your wife on a film, in a film situation. Yeah. Tell us about Chai. Uh, I was trying to make Meru. I'd actually made two versions of it. They both sucked. <laughs> I, I thought they were both fine. <laughs> fine. That's not like a ringing endorsement. Yeah, exactly. I'm kind of obsessive <laughs> and, and fine. a perfectionist. Well, it just didn't, I knew it could be more than it was. It wasn't quite where I wanted it to be because I, I, I had felt the potential of it and I knew what I wanted to say and I wasn't quite doing what I wanted it to say. It wasn't so much about, it wasn't doing what I wanted to say, it wasn't hitting people with the way I wanted people to feel. And that's a lot of how I, I'm inspired by films is, if I have a story where I, I, I know how I want people to feel mm -hmm. because I feel it and I want to translate that feeling, um, that's a lot about how I pick films and, and think about films. But I met Chai and I, she was already a very well-established filmmaker. She made her first film when she was 22. She 
submitted it to Tribeca, won Best Documentary at Tribeca when she was 22, and then went on to make a lot of other um, pretty incredible, kind of more socioeconomic films. But um, she uh, decided, I asked her if she would take a look at the film. That's a classic first date kind of line. We're like, will you, will you check out my film? Yeah. <laughs> it looks better in the dark. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me turn that off. <laughs> um, actually, it was really funny because she didn't respond for three months uh -huh. because she was in Africa making a film, and I just assumed she Typical totally story. blew me off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but she did watch the film, and classic Chai, if you ever meet her, you'll understand, but she um, called me and, and there was no kind of like, hey, how are you doing? How's it going? It was like, I picked up the phone and she said, Jimmy? I'm like, yeah. She's like, it's Chai. And I was like, hey, how's it going? She's, she didn't respond to anything. She just said, what do you want to do with this film? And I was like, well, I mean, I would like to make it into a you know, anyways. You're like, I just wanted to not suck. And she's like, I got you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just trying to get a second date, Chai. Yeah. 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 yeah, pretty much. And then... Uh, How did she change it? How does her sensibility and maybe her femininity affect a story like Meru? Well, first of all, she doesn't... She's not interested in climbing whatsoever. Um, Which is invaluable. Because that yeah. helps it be more interesting to those of us who don't know that much about climbing. I know, if, if, if I had made the film free solo, it just would have been uncut three hours free soloing on cap, and like, this is <laughs> sick. <laughs> but. That's a movie I really want to see. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, people have asked for it. They're uh -huh. like, you all shot the whole thing, right? Can't you just cut the whole climb together? Yeah. All the climbers are like, we want to see him climb every single pitch. But How many hours would that be? It's almost four. It's like 3.56 or something. Yeah. yeah. No. It's like a Scorsese. Director, we could way. almost, we could almost do it. But uh, yeah, I mean, she was much more interested in um, the relationships and other parts of the story. But I, I was very clear that I knew what that film was. I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be about friendship and mentorship, mm -hmm. loyalty, and um, and. But I couldn't quite figure out how to get there. And she immediately came in and said, "Well." you're way too close to everybody in the film. In fact, you're in the film, so you have no objectivity, and you guys are just having bro talk. Like, and so she went and re-interviewed everybody. She did? Yeah. Um, and I will say that most of the interviews from John Crocker were I did, but all the other ones mm -hmm. with Conrad and myself and Renan, she, she came in and... Um, and she, like Alex said, she's definitely in the edit um, way more. Like our division of labor is kind of like usually it's like 80% of production, physical production I do and she'll do like 20%, although her 20% is usually... <laughs> The, Usually the 20, makes the final the 20 cut. 20% that gets used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she does like 80% of, of the post and edit. Well, you know, it's interesting about I write books, and if, if I took me all day to write a paragraph, and then my husband reads it down the line and says, I think you should cut this, it's like, oh God, you don't know what went yeah. into that. And it must be. Yeah. Gen X that for you. Like, you don't, I was hanging under a no, thing no, and I had to like, fish out with, my camera. With the film Free Solo, we spent a month in Morocco doing this crazy thing where uh, my partner and I climbed these crazy walls and I free soloed this crazy thing. It all had never been done before. It's basically a month of hard labor. And then in the film, it was what, like 60 seconds of B roll. Basically, like, while they're doing interviews, they just show some kind of scenic shots of like people climbing on brown rock. It's like, oh it doesn't even God. show that it's Morocco. And we were like, we all had the shits for a month. Like, you know, it's like bad water. You're sort of like, we were like, we were laboring, we were toiling, it was so hard. 18 like, hour days, back to yeah, back to back. Yeah, to it's back. like, and Chai literally, was like, well, it's not Chai was like, yeah, it doesn't make the movie. We're like, come on. Like, what does it take? We're like, <laughs> cutting edge climbing, though. never been done. Everybody, like. It's funny you bring that up because I've never had more pushback from my crew on something getting cut. Yeah. Than that. Yeah, because we thing. all worked so freaking hard. <laughs> People were like, they were like, Morocco is like 60 seconds in the movie. And I'm like, don't even talk to me about it. <laughs> Talk to Chai. <laughs> Talk to Chai. Yeah, it was like the hardest we've all worked. And you're like, if this isn't good enough for a movie, then what is? You're right. like, come on. Right. Like, this is some of like, the raddest climbing. Well, the yeah. love story 
And I still remember it because you know, Chai and I are obviously parents of kids, and I was off on some shoot, and you know, they're usually very hurried conversations on a sat phone where it's like, James has been misbehaving. I had to take Marina to the hospital, and da 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 da. da. And you know, I'm probably in Alaska or something, being like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then right before she hangs up, she says, oh, and by the way, I turned Free Solo into a love story and then hung up. Ah! And I'm like, What'd you, what was that last part? <laughs> oh, hello? <laughs> hello? Sorry, hello? the connection's not good. Bye. <laughs> yeah. No, she literally hung up. She's like, oh, and by the way, I turned Free Solo into a love story and, I, and then hung up. And I was like, yeah. I, was re I remember being like, what? What was the last part? Being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it won the Oscar. It did. Yeah. Yeah, thank goodness they, they cut the Morocco scene. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, before we go, I wanted to take a minute and show a little clip from your new movie, As Promised. Do you want to set it up? Yeah. So this is a film, we've actually started filming it um, while we were filming Free Solo. Uh, so we've been working on it for quite some time. We make films concurrently, but again, yes, this is a film that kind of touches on the story of Doug Tompkins and Chris Tompkins and Yvonne Chouinard, who were huge inspirations for me uh, as I came up. They were icons in, in the outdoor world, but they were pioneers as climbers, but then pioneers as entrepreneurs, and then pioneers as conservationists. But it, it is a big, fat love story, and it's, you'll see. Yay for love stories. Let's roll it. In the very beginning, Doug and I were living in the middle of this paradise. And we said, it would be incredible to save this place. Just save it. Doug and Chris, you would see them together and it was like teenage kids. He was very charming. I thought, that's the man I was supposed to marry. It was scandalous. These were the original dirtbag climbers and surfers and skiers who go on to create the outdoor clothing business as we know it. And then there was the change. On any scorecard, nature is losing. They saw nature being destroyed. And if we destroy nature, we destroy ourselves. The ultimate do-it-yourself approach to saving the Earth, buying it. We started to realize it was possible to create a national park with the idea that we would donate it back to the country. And they're going, come on, nobody does that. A desire to preserve this place. I think that is as strong a bond as any two people can have. And then the worst thing that could happen to me happened. Douglas Tompkins died Tuesday in an accident in Chile. I was on my knees. This audacious vision of Doug's, that was like a life raft for me. But we need to finish up these parks. It's now or never. It was so unlikely that you could pull that off. She became more and more fierce. I asked myself, how can I come this far without you? But then I remembered, you've been here all along. Look, 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 look. Doug would be so happy. They define an entire way of life. Look at this incredible wildness, as far as you can see. Before I died, I wanted this life. Something wild. Thank you guys for designing things carefully and with purpose and sustainability in mind. I want to thank you guys for being models of preparation and attention to detail and ambition and love. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you guys.